Welcome once again to the Richardson Sloan Special Collection Center's Preservation Workshop Series. Today we will be talking about family archives and how to preserve them, organize them, and house them. We'll give you some helpful tips and tricks. So let's get started. What is a family archive? Family archives, as we are describing them today, pertain to materials and objects relating to a group of individuals related by ancestry. Types of materials and objects found in family archives depend on what an individual family collects or what you want to save of your family history. These materials may include photos, even photo albums, letters, school and medical records, scrapbooks, recipes, family Bibles, and also including book collections, textiles and fiber arts, artworks, and then three-dimensional artifacts known as realia. Today, we will also talk about how to organize, preserve, and house these family relics to preserve them for the future. First, though, we will cover the basics of where to start and then cover three key takeaways that can be applied to family archives that will help keep all types of materials safe. We want to share some basics with you about how you can start your own family archive preservation project. In the next few slides, we will be talking about how you can survey your collection and examine those materials. We will also be giving you some guidelines on organization, preservation, and archival housing from libraries, archives, and museums. But first, we will cover the three takeaways. So, reversible treatments, storage, location, and temperature will help extend the life of any material. A stable environment with minor handling is the best to preserve keepsakes. So, if able, please store materials with by format or type because this will help de decrease transference or off-gassing or acid transfer. With certain types of materials, please be aware that they might need a barrier layer between individual objects depending on how they will be stored. If there are items that are in poor con physical condition or are sentimental or historically important to your family or to the community, please take action to preserve and rehouse those items first. Next, we will be diving into surveying your collection. On this slide, we'll be walking you through how to conduct a survey of your collection. Depending on the time, space, and effort you'd like to spend on this project, it may mean thinking through what you want to do with the materials at hand and what you have in your family archive first. But regardless of that, we'll give you the first steps on what you should do um, to start the survey. So first, you want to gather together all the materials that you have and that you want to go through. Spread them out on a safe surface like a kitchen table or um, a space that isn't going to be ruffled by any winds or animals or other folks in your living in your household. Um, so you can kind of see if there are any unifying themes such as um, uh, particular relative scrapbooks, um, vacation photos or photo albums that are um, from a particular time period or from a particular person, letters between relatives such as family, um, letters from back home or from the war or from parents before they met, um, those types of things. So you want to kind of get a sense of what the collection has in front of you. Um, and as archivists, we like to evaluate the materials within context of other similar materials. So we like to have a photo, but um, if we don't have anything to kind of put it into historical or temporal context, it doesn't really mean too much. It's still an artifact of history, but um, it's always nice to have those other materials around it. The next step is to select what you want to keep. So you can do this based on a couple different um, characteristics of the materials. So you can do this based on importance, format, uniqueness, completeness, age, quantity, and quality. 
So first off, if it's something sentimental to your family or historically important, you might give more importance to that um, format. So if you have access to it, um, so a lot of us have a lot of old technology at our house um, from different periods of time. So like VHS tapes, um, Polaroid cameras, things like that. Um, audiovisual materials are very flexible and fluid over the years. Um, so you might not be able to access um, or listen or engage with the material if it's in a format that you can't listen to or to play. Um, so that might make some decisions for you. Or if you just want to keep it because it's an important speech or family reunion that you have recorded. Um, those are all questions that you should ask yourself um, if it's unique. Um, so if it's one of a kind, if it's a, um, a medal or award that's only given out every 10 years, things like that. Um, completeness, um, you can kind of gauge that. So if your relative wrote and was an editor for a particular newsletter or magazine and you don't have all the issues that you have, um, those might be some considerations that you want to think about age. So if it's too old or if it's too new, um, those types of questions. But And then quantity and quality. So those are questions that we probably ask ourselves about everything. So those are some things that you can kind of help determine what you want to keep in your collection. So next is determining what your treasures are. So kind of like the, the select what you keep um, section, treasures can hold sentimental, personal, or historical value for you and your family. Um, but things to consider are keeping materials that are audiovisual, um, awards and certificates, correspondence, letters and emails, diaries and journals, genealogical information, legal documents, um, documents about where your relative lived, in addition to artifacts and documents that describe where folks lived. You can also save publications and newsletters, photo albums, scrapbooks, speeches, and lectures, and then also vital records. Next, we'll want to talk about removing unimportant items from your family's archives. So not all materials have to be kept in their entirety. Some examples that can be removed are calendars, they can be discarded after birthdays, anniversaries, and other events are noted elsewhere. Um, they can be kept if they have other um, notes or daily um, jottings or it kind of becomes a calendar, uh, a journal, or a diary. Um, so then that adds a little bit more significance to that type of document. Um, you can toss random unrelated materials or insignificant or unidentifiable photos. So some photos that have been taken over the years are blurry and you can't see anything or if it's a location that you really can't identify, you can toss those. Um, also financial records may be removed unless it's documenting cost of living expenses or heirloom purchases. These might also be interesting if you're um, relative worked at a, a well-known um, business or something like that. They That might be interesting to see. Um, but then um, talk, talking about removing materials, you can also decide to gift your archives or intentionally separate your collection. So gifting your archives um, kind of is just your choice. Um, so you don't have to keep your collection after you organize it. You can, if you have a family that agrees, you can donate it, um, donate the collection to a local um, library or museum. If your family was influential in the community at the city, um, county, or state level, uh, archive may be, a, may be interested in the the collection 
um, libraries, archives, historical societies, and museums all collect um, family archives. Um, to a certain degree, you'll have to look at their collection development policies if you have a particular one in mind. Um, also, if you have a family archive that um, could be separated based on family lines, that can also be done. Um, or if it's very large, you want to separate it to share it with siblings and things like that. Um, and you can also um, sell or give away your items instead of throwing them out. So those are a lot of different options for you in that way. But um, just as an aside, please give yourself time to reflect on your decisions, especially if you are unsure of what to keep or if you're having trouble deciding what to do with a particular item. Just give yourself some time and reflect on those decisions. We'll be covering questions that you can ask while you are examining the materials that you have in front of you. So you can either ask your self or relatives these questions. So who created these materials? Is there a recognizable way that they're organized? Are they labeled or identified in some way? Are they accurate? Are those labels accurate? Um, what types of records are they? What's their physical condition? What are their date ranges? And what are... What's the completeness of the collection? The organization or arrangement of your family archives will depend on your preferences and how you want to access them, especially if there's no discernible order to them already. It may be easiest to arrange the materials chronologically or by subject. Arrangement by format is also an appropriate way to organize materials. Each method will offer a variety of ways to house and provide access to the materials. You may even want to consider arranging your archives by periods of your life or your relatives' lives, um, such as childhood, college, young adulthood, and so on. Or you can organize materials by where you created them, such as at work or at home. Within these groupings or series, one could then organize by subject, format, or chronologically. Another way to arrange is by using the organic collection method. So that kind of just means a body of record that grows as a result of routine activities of its creator. So you're creating that um, order by that when you create it. On this slide, we'll be talking about preservation. This will be pointing back to the do no harm or reversible treatments. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, some, so some very basics. So when handling any types of material, wash your hands and dry them before using them. Try not to use lotions or hand sanitizers before handling materials um, as that will transfer those oils onto those fragile documents and photos and objects. Um, use gloves if possible when handling photos, negatives, and film and objects. Um, but I know that not everyone has cotton gloves or nitrile gloves at home. Um, so just emphasizing washing and drying your hands before handling any materials. Try not to touch the photographic um, part of a photo, the emulsion, because um, your fingerprint might end up in the on the print. Um, so try and touch them by the edges, things like that. Um, use pencils, book um uh, when handling books, try to be sensitive to how far they open. Um, try and cradle them in your hands or on the on a table, um, things like that. We have other um, presentations that go into more detail on these types of topics. Um, and then also, when you're writing or um, preparing. Uh, materials for housing and things like that don't lean or write on top of them um, as that will cause transference. And then on the actual slide, we'll just talk about a little um, list of things that might damage your materials. So light, um, natural and artificial sources can cause fading and disintegration. Pollutants such as dust are abrasive and um, other um, pollutants such as like cleaning solutions, things like that can also be harmful to materials. Heat, high temperatures can accelerate that deterioration. 
moisture of any kind can also cause mold growth, corrosion, and degradation, um, and cracking and things like that. We don't want to um, cause that to happen. Um, pests, they really like to eat organic matter, so insects and other little creatures. Um, so keeping them away from the materials is good. And then handling. So um, when pulling a book off the shelf, you can damage the headband. Um, it can cause scratches to um, the binding. Or with photographs, you can scratch um, off the emulsion layer. Um, and then also just normal use can cause um, damage. And then also other types of preservation concerns is lamination that is irreversible. So um, we don't recommend laminating any historical documents that you want to keep for long periods of time. On this slide, we'll be talking about archival housing and the characteristics of that storage material that you'll want to look for. So first off, you'll want to house all of your materials in storage that is acid free. So we have a lot of variety and options out there today um, that will fit your price point. Um, Gaylord has a lot of good stuff, University Products, Hollinger, Metal Edge. Um, and there's a lot of great companies and they have a variety of products that might suit your needs. Um, so anything acid-free will be good for your materials. They will um, decrease transference of already acidic materials and then also prevent um, pests and light and um, acid from leaching into your materials. The next thing that we'll want to look at is buffered versus non-buffered. Um, so calcium carbonate is added to paper products to make it non-acidic. Um, and so that's the buffered product. Certain types of photographs and things like that don't do well in buffered um, materials. So you'll just want to kind of do your research and see if um, your objects would benefit from that. Um, and if you have any questions, just contact us here at the library. We would be happy to help. The next um, type of material that you can use for storage is polyester or polypropylene. Um, you'll also hear it referred to as mylar. Um, these are plastics that are suitable for use in preserving materials. They are stable. Um, so one key takeaway is if it smells like plastic, don't use it. Um, vinyl is really bad. It's unstable. It can um, cause damage to your materials in the long term, things like that. But polypropylene and polyester, they um, can preserve your materials for longer. Um, you can use this material to encapsulate or cover dust jackets on books. You can um, create little envelopes for, um, for sleeves, for letters, uh, maps, things like that. Um, articles that you want to keep, newspaper clippings that you want to keep separate, um, things like that. Um, next, you'll want to select storage based on the size and quantity of your items. Um, so you'll want to kind of get a sense of what, how much you have and then how what size they are and what um, types of storage needs they might um, need. And so um, also be critical of materials that say that they're archival because sometimes if they're sold in like craft stores, they might not always be um, archival. Um, so you'll just want to make sure that you're buying them from a reputable vendor. You can also test the materials if you get an archival pen. Um, it can test if it's acidic or um, not. So you can see what you buy and then um, you can use it based on that. Um, there are also resources to help you learn what types of materials are best to use. Um, and most folks, if you want to ask a question, they'll be happy to help you. Um, and then also there's the photographic activity test that's um, very well known in the community. You can use that to um, test your photographs. And then also encapsulation, I've mentioned that under mylar, uh, that's a really good way to 
preserve almost anything that's flat. Um, and so you can use that method in a lot of different things. So essentially just um, do no harm and try and box it in acid-free um, storage containers. Um, we have a lot of other fun videos that talk about that on our YouTube. So you can check out those on our Davenport Public Library YouTube channel under Special Collections Playlist. Um, but those are the basics for archival housing. Thank you so much for watching this preservation workshop on how to preserve your family archives. We hope this will help you in preserving your family heirlooms and objects. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Please check out our collections online. We do have family archives in our collection. Um, and then also follow us on social media. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.